to worship again this morning. Glad you all are here. If there are any visitors, we would encourage you to fill out the little sticky note that's on the front of your bulletin, and you can just put that into the offering basket today. That way we'll know you're here, and we can have your information. Or if you're a member and any of your information has changed, please fill that out as well. It's a good way for us to just keep track of that. And again, you can just put it right in the offering basket. So let's pray as we dive into God's Word today. Father God, as we gather together today, in the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray today, come Holy Spirit. Amen. We are in our second to last week of this Fan or Follower series. We've already done seven weeks of this series, and we have today, or this weekend, and then next to wrap that up. So coming into the home stretch here, so glad you're here to join us for this. And again, this series, Fan or Follower, is based on Kyle Eidelman's book, Not a Fan. I know a lot of it, we had some copies, a lot of them have gone, so hopefully if you've read that, you've been blessed by that as well. So today we are going to take up Jesus' um, statement that we read in the gospel today, to take up your cross daily. And what does that mean? And what does that look like for us as we seek to be followers of Jesus? But before we jump into that, I want to do a little activity with you today. So what you're going to see on the screen here are several images. And what I want you to do when they come up is to just say or call out what that image represents. So here's a practice one. You should all get this. Broncos. Broncos. Good job. Okay, keep going. Major League Baseball, good job. Air Jordan, come on people, this is his own brand, Michael Jordan has his own brand. Tough one. Anyone know? What? Penguin Publishing, yes, Publishing House. Rolling Stones, good job. Jesus Christ, good job. Or we could say Christianity, the logo of Christianity of Jesus Christ. So that's the last one, good job. You all are well immersed in the world of logos. You have been brainwashed by brands, that's good. But when we look at logos and things like that, as I think about that and as um, you know, companies come up with that, I think there are, among other things, probably two things that they're really trying to drive home with that. One is they want to make their logo memorable. You want it so just like you all did. You see that logo and you're able to say what that represents. So they want it to be memorable. I think the other thing is they want it to be attractive. With all those logos, a lot of time and thought probably went into that and creating, my favorite is probably the Nike swoosh. I mean, the fact that you see this little funky line and that automatically makes you think, of Nike, of the sporting line, but it's an attractive logo, and that's what all those are. So when we think about the cross, the logo of Jesus Christ, and therefore also the logo of his followers, of Christians, does that meet those two characteristics? Is the cross memorable? Yeah, I think we would say the cross is definitely memorable. And when you think especially about that early audience, the early followers of Jesus the cross would have been incredibly memorable because anyone who had witnessed a crucifixion would remember the cross. For the, we hear in the Gospels, obviously, of several followers of Jesus, John, Jesus' mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, and some of the other women who were right there at the foot of the cross. For them, I'm sure the image of the cross was seared into their memory. So it's memorable, yes. What about attractive? Probably not, right? We wouldn't say the cross is attractive. And especially, like I said, for those who had witnessed that, it would have been farthest thing from attractive in their minds. But we have taken this logo, or taken the cross and made it our logo. This is the image of Christianity. We heard in our second reading today from 1 Corinthians 1.18, these words from Paul. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, excuse me, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I think when the world looks at the cross, 
they would be well within their rights to say, well, that's foolish. Why would you have an image of torture, an image of execution as your logo, especially those early, in that early context? Probably really would have scoffed at that and said, well, that's foolish. But as we know, the cross is the symbol of power. It is the symbol of Christ's victory over death. See, I think in our modern world, though, what we've often done is taken the brutality of the cross and we've bedazzled it. We've turned it into this nice image. So we wear cross jewelry. That's nothing against anyone here wearing cross jewelry. I have a ring that has crosses on it. And for Christians, it's a, it is a symbol of who we are, of in whose image we are made, of Christ's sacrifice for us. But you often see unbelievers, non-Christians, wearing crosses too as just an accessory. And I think that uh, that's pretty common, that people just say, oh, it's a nice, we can make, dress it up, make it jewelry, and it kind of loses its power. I think the same can be true of preaching about the cross. That instead of preaching about the reality of the cross, the brutality of the cross, but also which leads to the victory, we try to make the cross comfortable. In his book, Kyle Eidelman refers to this kind of thing as snuggy theology. Okay, true confession time. How many here own a snuggie? Let's see hands. Yes. Same last night. We had a few. I think we need to have snuggie Sunday here where we all wear snuggies. Wouldn't that just be comfy? I think it would be good. In his book, Kyle Eidelman says he really just wanted a Snuggie, and so his wife finally gave him one. He said, really, it was a bathrobe turned backwards. He was like, you know, but the allure of it was so appealing. But it is. It looks incredibly comfortable. And I think that's what we often do in the church and with preaching and all that, is we try to make sure everyone is comfy and cozy. But Jesus' logo isn't a Snuggie. Jesus' logo is a cross. Our logo as Christians is a cross. And there is nothing comfortable about rugged wood and rusted nails. So I want to turn to our teaching lesson for today, Luke chapter 9, and look more closely where Jesus unveils this logo for his followers. It's up on the screen here, again, page 1489, your pew Bibles. And I want to look specifically at Luke chapter 9, verse 23. So again, what it says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now you kind of have that opening part. He said to all, If anyone, if anyone would come after me. So that kind of sets it up. And then Jesus gives three things that his followers must do. And I want to just unpack those here. So the first one, deny himself. So to deny yourself. What is that about? We see that in the disciple Peter. We see Peter, on as Jesus is on trial, denying Jesus three times, right? So Peter goes the exact opposite of denying himself. He denies Jesus. But that's not the end of the story for Peter. Peter is reinstated by Jesus, that beautiful threefold question of Jesus, do you love me? Feed my sheep, that whole response. And then we see in the book of Acts, Peter denying himself, and he gives it all for God's glory. He preaches the gospel boldly, ultimately leading to his crucifixion, crucified upside down for the sake of the gospel. Or the young, rich young ruler, rich young man from last week that we heard about, again, what was standing in the way of him following Jesus was that he had made money his idol. That was what he cared most deeply about. It wasn't just that he was rich and therefore could inherit eternal life, but what he cared about the most were his things, his possessions, his wealth. And so that's what Jesus goes right after. Deny that and then follow me. Jesus knows with each of us what it is that keeps us from fully following him. So he's going to go right after that in your life and say, deny that. And be set free to truly follow me. So first thing, deny yourself. Second, take up your cross daily. I think we often think that that refers to simply the struggles and hardships in life. So if you are going through a disease, that that is taking up your cross. Or if you've lost your job and are seeking employment, you've taken up your cross 
I think it was Diane who recently said in a little prayer in, in the worship that that actually happens to believers and unbelievers alike, which is really true. Everybody goes through those things. That is simply life in a broken world, that those hardships come. To take up your cross is specific to the hardships and suffering you will endure for following Jesus Christ. So if you lose your job because of your faith, that is taking up your cross. If you're mocked for your faith, if you're teased for your faith, that's taking up your cross. So again, that's an important distinction, I think. To take up your cross also, we see that in the news a lot with persecution around the world. Fortunately, we don't see that probably a lot here, but we hear about it more and more. And in those times, I believe we must drop to our knees and pray for our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted for their faith, who in many cases are going to their death, are literally going to the cross for their grave. Because here's the thing. Jesus' invitation is ultimately an invitation to die. Appealing sales pitch, isn't it? Kind of makes you want to just run after him. But that's what we get from Jesus in these stories. When Jesus draws a large crowd, he doesn't give them snuggy theology. He says, come, take up your cross and die daily. It's no wonder that people often turn away and leave when Jesus starts talking like that. The disciples get really worried. Why are you saying that? People are coming. And yet Jesus wants followers. Because the decision to follow Jesus is a decision to die daily to ourselves. In his book, Kyle Adelman says that in his closet, he has three words, and he has it in his closet, so he'll see it first thing every morning. And they're drawn from 1 Corinthians 15. It says, I die daily. And he says he has that there, so every morning he will remember he must die to himself if he's going to truly follow Jesus. We see the same thing in Luther's small catechism where he talks about We must daily put to death the old Adam so that our new self may rise daily in Christ Jesus. This is not a new thought. This is straight from Jesus' mouth, Paul, Luther. We hear it and not a fan again. This is the invitation Jesus gives. So deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Now notice that this is the final step listed by Jesus, to follow me. But I think we usually... Treat that as the first step. Oh, I just need to follow Jesus. I can follow Jesus without giving anything up. I can follow Jesus without any risk. I can follow Jesus without any discomfort. The Greek word follow, I'll probably butcher this, but akolotheo means become devoted or attached to, involving a solemn commitment to someone. That's the word follow there. Solemn commitment to attach yourself to someone or something. I want to compare that to a place later in Luke's gospel. It'll come up on the screen here, but you can also turn to it if you'd like. It's from Luke chapter 23, verse 49. It's on page 1519 of your pew Bibles. And this is right after Jesus has breathed his last breath in Luke's gospel. And then we get this word. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now we know, as I said before, that there were followers of Jesus who were right at the foot of the cross. Many of those were those women. The men, the disciples fled, aside from John, but those women stayed firm. They risked much by staying there, by saying, I'm with him. But here we see these women who had followed Jesus, but at this point stand at a distance watching. Now this follow is different from that previous follow where it talks about a solemn commitment, attaching yourself to someone. This follow is more in the sense of accompanying someone. So these followers had accompanied Jesus as he went about his daily activities and had followed him in that sense But when life got tough, when Jesus was nailed to a cross, they drew back into the shadows. They stood at a distance watching. So my question is, does this sum up the way in which you follow Jesus? 
Are you happy to follow Jesus until, faith, until things get tough? At which point you fade into the shadows. You stand at a distance watching. I think that's an important question for each one of us to consider. So turning back to our preaching text for today, Luke chapter 9. We get these words, and I think these words should convict us. Again, on the screen or back to page 1489 in your pew Bible. Here are Jesus' words. Right after he gives that commandment, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me, he says this. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. There are two things really going on here. The first is that in verse 26, that part about if anyone is ashamed of me. Again, that's what we see later in Luke's gospel. When things get tough and you fade into the shadows or you withdraw from Jesus, separate yourself from him, That act of hiding our faith is an act of being ashamed of Jesus. I'm with Jesus until life gets tough. And Jesus' words into that, if you are ashamed of me and my words, I will be ashamed of you when I come into glory. If that doesn't convict us, I don't know what does. Jesus calls us to connect, to commit ourselves to him even when life gets tough. And why? Why? Why does he want that for us? Well, again, you get that at the very opening, verse 24. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. We find life daily when we daily die to ourselves, to the things that we want to put before following Jesus. That's what he wants us to put to death. So the question today which is the question that we've been trying to raise throughout this series. Fan or follower? Which one are you? As we just heard in this text, there is much at stake when it comes to deciding if you're a fan or a follower of Jesus. As we've been talking about this on staff, some one of the ideas that's kind of emerged is that I think often when people enter the church or come for the first time, they come as fans. And I think that's actually okay. Because they want to come. They want to see, what's this all about? Who is this Jesus guy? What are these Christians all about? And so oftentimes they're drawn by things like our programming or the worship that we do or space that we provide that makes them feel valued or that they, you have that cool space that they want to come and check out. And again, I don't think that's a bad thing. Sometimes it takes allowing people to be fans first, to come and want to just stand and observe and see what's going on. But for those of us who claim the title of Christian, we really can't be content with remaining fans. Because if we're going to seek to reach those who are starting out as fans, we must be followers so that we can model for them what a life transformed for Christ really looks like. Like Jesus, we must become cross-bearers. This is not snuggy theology, people. This is rough. Jesus took the cross for us. He did that so that we can live, so that we don't have to die for our sins in that way. But he does call us, like you see Simon Cyrene, to do the same, to take up our cross, to bear our cross for him, to live a life that is devoted to him, even when things get tough, so that people will see that and say there's something about these people that's different. I've heard it said that in the early church, it was often said, see how they love each other of early Christians. And I think that's how we do it. We don't just love each other when life is rosy. We love each other in the trenches when life gets tough. I want to read a quote for you from Kyle Eidelman's book that really asked some profound questions. It really messed with me when I read it this fall, and hopefully it will mess with you a little bit now in a good way as we really wrestle with what it means to follow Jesus. So here's what Kyle Edelman says. 
And here's the question that is keeping me awake these days. Am I really carrying a cross if there is no suffering and sacrifice? When is the last time following Jesus cost you something? When is the last time it cost you a relationship? When is the last time following Jesus cost you a promotion? When is the last time it cost you a vacation? When is the last time you were mocked for your faith? Forget about having our lives threatened. When is the last time you went without a meal for the sake of the gospel? Can you really say you're carrying a cross if it hasn't cost you anything? Take a second and answer that question in your mind. Has it cost you anything? If there is no sacrifice involved, if you're not at least a little uncomfortable, then there's a good chance you aren't carrying a cross. I don't believe Kyle's words there are intended to just guilt us, that we should say, man, I need to go and seek out being mocked or things like that. But I do believe he is trying to challenge us. And that's what scripture does. Jesus' words are meant to challenge us, to push us out of our comfort zones. And so that is what I hope to do today as well, to challenge you to consider if you are being a cross-bearer for Jesus Christ. Now, I don't speak to you today as one who has this all figured out by any means, or one who has made the move from fan to follower completely, because I haven't. And yet, I do believe that God is calling us to not be satisfied with our inclination to be fans. I believe to be content with being both fan and follower reveals the heart of a fan. The title of this series is not Fan and Follower. It is Fan or Follower. Jesus is calling us to something much greater than simply being a fan. We know that we are sinful. We know there are days where we will be more like a fan. We know that we are not perfect. And yet, Jesus doesn't call us or doesn't expect us to be perfect in every moment. Following Jesus isn't about being perfect, but about committing our lives to following him despite our imperfections. So while being a fan of Jesus is a good place to start, we are being called to something much greater today. We are called today and every day to die to ourselves so that we can truly live to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Your word, which at so many times is really tough and really challenging. Your word today, which calls us to take up our cross daily. We pray, Lord God, that it will challenge us to evaluate our faith, to decide if we're content to simply follow you until life gets tough, if we're content to simply stand at a distance watching or if we're ready to get into the trenches and follow you. We know, Lord God, that it's all about your grace, that we are saved not by anything that we do or anything that we could do, but by your great love and grace alone. And yet, you call us to something great. You call us to follow you, to put to death our desires, all that would keep us from you, and to step out into life, life abundant in you. And in doing so, for others to see that and to want to have a part of it as well. So we pray, Lord God, today that you will give each of us the courage to take up our cross and follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.